Abu Zaid al-Hassan al-Sirafi said, I've examined this foregoing book, meaning the first book, having been commanded to look carefully through it, and to verify the information I find in it about the affairs of the sea and about its kings and their various circumstances, and to compare this information with other reports passed down about these kings, known to myself but not appearing in the book. I found the date of the book to be about the year 237, a time when maritime businesses still ran on an even keel, on account of all the toing and froing overseas by merchants from Iraq. I also found that everything recounted in the first book follows a truthful and voracious line. The Indians and Chinese are all of the opinion that, of the world's kings, four are to be counted as great. They consider the first of these four to be the king of the Arabs. It is a unanimous opinion among them, about which there is no disagreement that of the four kings, he is the mightiest, the richest in possessions, and the most resplendently fine in appearance, and that he is the king of the great religion to which nothing is superior. The king of China counts himself next in importance after the king of the Arabs, then comes the Byzantine king, and finally Balhara, king of the Indians who pierce their ears. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning platform. Skillshare has been very useful for me and my brother over at History Time on our YouTube journey. Not just for more technical classes like this excellent one from Dan Dan Lee on documentary film, but also for simple life hacks like this productivity class from Thomas Frank. Simple tips that have been able to turn this lockdown on its head for my brother and me, and have helped us make time to create a whole third YouTube channel in the gaps we freed up. And that's Skillshare. Whether you're a professional or just starting out, it's a great resource for self-improvement with thousands of classes fit for any schedule. And to start you off, the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity and make the most of 2021. In every kingdom in India, the ruling family belong to a single dynasty, from which the royal title never passes to another house. They appoint crown princes. The case is similar with scribes and physicians. They all belong to distinct family lines to which the particular occupation is restricted. The various kings in India do not owe allegiance to a single ruler. Instead, each is master of his own country. Balhara, however, is regarded as India's king of kings. In contrast to the Indians, the Chinese do not appoint crown princes. I do not know of a single member of India who is a Muslim uh, and Arabic is not spoken. The Indians possess few horses, that they are more common in China. The Chinese, however, do not possess elephants and do not let them remain in their land as they regard them ill-omened. The king of India has many troops, but they are not paid as regular soldiers. Instead, he summons them to fight for king and country, and they go to war at their own expense and at no cost at all to the king. In contrast, the Chinese give their troops regular pay, as the Arabs do. There are some in India whose habit is to wander the jungles and hills, seldom mixing with other people. Sometimes they live on leaves and jungle fruits and insert iron rings into the heads of their penises to stop them from having sexual intercourse with women. There are some among them who are naked and others who stand upright all day facing the sun, naked too but for a scrap of tiger or leopard skin. I once saw one of these men just as I have described. I went away and did not return until 16 years later, and there I saw him, still in the same position. I was amazed at how his eyes had not melted from the heat of the sun. The Indians wear two waist cloths and adorn themselves with bangles of gold and jewels, the men as well as the women. Indian men can marry as many women as they like. The staple food of the Indians is rice, they do not eat wheat. The Indians let their beards grow long, and I have often seen an Indian with a beard three cubits in length. Also, they don't clip their moustaches. Neither the Indians nor the Chinese bathe themselves when in a state of ritual pollution. The Indians, however, bathe daily before eating their morning meal. The Indians do not have sexual intercourse with their women when they are menstruating. Indeed, they find them so offensive that they turn them out of the house. 
India is greater in extent than China, several times so, and has a greater number of kings. China, though, is more densely inhabited and cultivated. The Chinese have no native tradition of religious learning. In fact, their religion came from India. They maintain it was the Indians who introduced the idols to their land, and that they, the Indians, were the original people of religion. In both lands, they believe in the transmigration of souls as a basic tenet, although they differ on the resulting details of dogma. In most of the land of India, there are no urban settlements, but everywhere you go in China, they have a great walled city. Also, China is a healthier country with fewer diseases and better air. In both countries, there are big rivers, some of them bigger than our rivers, and both have plentiful rain. India, however, has many desert areas, while all of China is populated and cultivated. Indians regard entertainment as shameful and never indulge in it. They don't drink intoxicating drink either, nor do they consume vinegar because it is produced from such drink. This is a case not of religious belief, but of disapproval. They say a king who drinks is not a king at all. The reason being that, in most Indian states, they are surrounded by neighboring kings who make war on them. So they say, how can someone run a kingdom properly if he is drunk? Sometimes kings fight each other for the control of a state, but this happens infrequently. I've never seen anyone actually take another king's country by force, except in the case of a people neighboring the land of Pepper. And if a king does conquer another kingdom, he appoints some member of the defeated king's family to rule it as his puppet, because the people of the kingdom will tolerate no other arrangement. When a king of the land of Sarandib dies, his course is paraded on a low-bedded cart, lying on its back with its head dangling off the rear of the cart, so that the hair drags up dust from the ground, and all the while a woman with a broom sweeps more dust onto the corpse's head and cries out, O oh, you people, behold your king! Only yesterday he reigned over you, and you obeyed his every word. See now what is come, and the manner of this going from the world, for the angel of death has taken his soul. Henceforth, let life delude you nevermore. Then a pyre of sandalwood, camphor, and saffron is made ready, and the corpse is burnt on it, and the ashes scattered to the wind. All the Indians burn their dead on pyres. Sarandib, the last of the islands, is part of the land of India. At times, it happens that when a dead king is burnt, his women folk enter the fire too and are burned alive along with him. But if they wish, they do not do so. In the case of the Indians, if a thief steals uh, as little as a filth or upwards, a long stake is brought. The end is sharpened, and then that thief is impaled on it, backside first, until the point comes out of his gullet. In India, if a man accuses another of an offence for which the mandatory penalty is death, the accuser is asked, will you subject the person you have accused to ordeal by fire? If he agrees to this, a piece of iron is first heated to such a high temperature that it becomes red hot. The accused man is told to hold out his hand, palm up, and on it are placed seven leaves from a particular tree of theirs. The red hot iron is then placed on his hand, on top of it the leaves. Next, the accused has to walk up and down holding the iron until he can bear it no longer and has to drop it. At this point, a leather bag is brought out. The man has to put his hand inside this, then the bag is sealed with the ruler's seal. When three days have passed, some unhusked rice is brought, and the accused man is told to husk it by rubbing it between his palms. If after this no mark is found on his hand, he is deemed to have got the better of the accuser, and he escapes execution. I have seen a man put his hand in and bring it out unharmed. In such a case too, his accuser is fined and mourned of gold. In Dharma's land, the marked bushan, or rhinoceros, is to be found. This animal has a single horn on the front of its forehead, and within this horn is a, is a marking, a naturally occurring figure depicting the likeness of a human being or, or some other form. The horn is black throughout, except for this white figure in its interior. This rhinoceros is, by nature, smaller than the elephant, but tends to be the same dark colour as the elephant. An elephant will run away in fear 
from a rhinoceros. The rhinoceros is a ruminant, like cattle and camels, and its flesh is permissible for Muslims. We have eaten it. The Chinese use them to make belts. All the kings of India and China believe in the transmigration of souls and hold it as an article of faith. A trustworthy informant reported that one of their kings in these lands was afflicted by smallpox. When he had recovered, he looked in the mirror and thought how hideous his face had become. Seeing one of his brother's sons, he said to him, It is not for the like of me to dwell in this body, now it is so changed. The body is, after all, a mere receptacle for the soul. When the soul passes out of it, it returns in another receptacle. You must be king in my place, for I shall now disjoin my soul from my body until such time as I alight in another body. He then called for a dagger of his that had a particularly sharp edge and commanded that his head be severed with it. He was duly decapitated, then his corpse was burnt. Certain kings of theirs, when they ascend the throne, have rice cooked for them and placed for them on banana leaves. The new king invites three or four hundred of his companions. They come of their own free choice, not under any compulsion from the king, and gives them some of the rice, having first eaten some himself. One by one they come up to him, take a little of the rice, and eat it. It then becomes obligatory for all those who have eaten some of the rice, when the king dies or is killed, to burn themselves to death by fire. Concerning the Yasara that occurs in India, meaning the monsoon rain, it falls on the land continuously throughout the summer, for three consecutive months, night and day, the rainfall never letting up at all. They lay in their basic provisions in advance of it, and when the Yasara comes, they stay put in their houses, because they are solidly built of wood. No one ventures out, except for some pressing need. Craftsmen, however, ply their trades in these places throughout the period of the rains. Among the Indians, there are religious devotees and men of learning known as Brahmins, as well as poets who frequent the courts of kings, astrologers, philosophers, soothsayers, and those who take auguries from the flights of crows and other birds. In India, there are a group of people known as the Bikajis. They are naked, although their hair is so long that it covers their upper bodies. They let their fingernails grow as long as spearheads, for they are never clipped, or only if they get broken, and they live a life of wandering. I have avoided relating any of the sorts of accounts in which sailors exercise their powers of invention, but whose credibility would not stand up to scrutiny in other men's minds. I have also restricted myself to relating only the true contents of each account, and the shorter the better. And God it is who guides us to what is correct. And praise be to God, Lord of the universe, and may his blessings be upon the choicest part of his creation, Muhammad, and on all his family.